How do you manage to get relegated whilst having a higher wage bill than the Champions League finalists? Well, don't ask me, ask Queen's Park Rangers, who finished rock bottom of the Premier League table in the 2012-13 season, a massive 14 points from safety, despite having the 7th highest wage bill in the division. It was the culmination of years of madness at Loftus Road, which saw QPR go from the verge of bankruptcy to becoming the richest football club in England, sign no fewer than five Champions League winners, and have Peter Odenwingi rock up at Loftus Road and talk to the press on transfer deadline day in January 2013, only for his move from West Brom to Fall 3. It was the most embarrassing transfer deadline day moment captured by Sky Sports' cameras, other than that time when one of their reporters was assaulted with a purple dildo, and when Stoke City paid over £18 million for Gianni Imbula. It took Queen's Park Rangers 15 years to return to the Premier League, following the club's relegation in 1996, only for them to then go and spunk an ungodly amount of money on Sean Wright Phillips, Gibral Cisse, and Joey Barton. It had to be the most reckless spending spree that the Premier League's ever seen, other than Chelsea paying over £600 million to finish 12th last season, and Ty from AFTV every time that he enters the Arsenal club shop. Despite the club's brainless transfer business though, Rangers survived on the final day of the season, a day which is best remembered for the last minute title clinching goal that Sergio Aguero scored against them. You might have thought that, having got things so horribly wrong only to survive by the skin of their teeth, QPR might have learned their lesson. You really could not be any more wrong. Only three teams, Chelsea, Manchester United and Liverpool, had a higher net spend in the 2012-13 season than QPR, who spent twice as much as Manchester City. Mark Hughes confidently predicted that Rangers would never again have to fight relegation while he was at the club, a sentiment which was echoed by the club's chief executive, Philip Beard, who stated that QPR could now compete, and beat, every team in the Premier League. QPR won just four games the following season, and they had won none when Hughes was sacked 12 games into the campaign and replaced by Harry Redknapp. A decade on, QPR are still living in the shadow of their disastrous and short-lived stint in the Premier League and the mindless spending and bizarre decision-making which defined it. In today's video then, I want to take a closer look at perhaps the worst run club in the history of the Premier League, the idiots behind it, and how they managed to get everything so horribly wrong. QPR fans, you might want to look away now. For everyone else, sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to West London for an odyssey on precisely how not to run a Premier League football club. We start our story in the early 2000s, simpler times, back when Bolton Stadium was still called the Reebok, and Zoo Magazine felt it appropriate to send 250 scantily clad women to football tournaments in an attempt to curb hooliganism, but not without hosing them down first, of course. These might have been simpler times, but they were pretty rotten times for Queen's Park Rangers. Five years after dropping out of the Premier League, QPR entered administration in 2001 and were relegated to the third tier of English football for the first time since the 1960s. In order to buy their way out of administration, Rangers had taken on a £10 million high interest loan in 2002 from a company called ABC Corporation registered in Panama. The loan came with a 10% interest rate, more than double the Bank of England's rate at the time, but at least it came from a reputable financial institution. You know, the ABC Corporation. What? You mean to tell me that you've never borrowed any money from the ABC Corporation? Well, that is an awful shame. The man behind the mysterious company, based in one of the world's oldest and best-known tax havens, was widely reported as being Michael Hunt, the former managing director of Nissan UK. In 1993, Hunt was convicted of what was at that time the largest tax fraud in the history of the United Kingdom. Hunt siphoned off almost £150 million of undeclared profits from Nissan UK over a period of nine years, whilst defrauding HMRC of a record-breaking £56.3 million tax bill. 
Hunt was sentenced to seven years in prison, reduced to six upon appeal, but he was soon released as a very wealthy man, his net worth having been estimated at between 150 to 200 million pounds for the past decade. The old adage that crime never pays isn't always true. Still, at least QPR were out of administration, and the future of the club had been secured. It's not as though ABC Corporation had a mortgage on Loftus Road as part of the loan, and the club was unable to repay the 10% interest that was being accrued on the loan, let alone the principal itself. Oh no, wait, that's exactly what happened. QPR returned to the newly rebranded championship in 2004, but the high interest loan from ABC continued to hang like a noose around the club's neck. By the summer of 2007, QPR were once again on the precipice, with the £2.5 million sale of Lee Cook to West London rivals Fulham, who also donated his £250,000 signing on fee as a parting gift to the club, reportedly having prevented QPR from facing a winding up order and re-entering administration. QPR needed a saviour. And in September 2007, they got two of them, both from the world of Formula One. Flavio Briatori was the team principal of the Renault Formula One team, meanwhile Bernie Eccleston was Mr. Formula One, having transformed the sport into a multi-billion dollar business through marketing and television rights deals from the 1970s onwards, making himself very wealthy in the process. Both Briatori and Eccleston, it must be said, are men of questionable moral scruples. Briatori was convicted of multiple counts of fraud in Italy during the 1980s, receiving two separate prison sentences. Briatori avoided jail time by fleeing to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, where he lived as a fugitive, and even opened Benetton stores on the Caribbean island. It was Briatori's relationship with Luciano Benetton, founder of the Benetton Group, which made him very rich. Benetton appointed Briatori as the head of his American operations when the company began expanding and opening stores in the US, with Briatori taking a cut of each franchising agreement. Given that over 800 Benetton stores were open throughout America, Briatori's wealth was soon set to total in the hundreds of millions. He only returned to Europe after his convictions were extinguished as part of an amnesty, and soon Benetton asked him to take charge of his new Formula One team. Briatore returned to Formula One with Renault in 2000, later resigning amidst a race-fixing scandal which rocked the sport. Eccleston, meanwhile, has seven subheadings under the controversy section of his Wikipedia page, which include classics such as Hitler remarks and illegal possession of a firearm. In case you were wondering, Eccleston tried to take a gun on a private jet in Brazil and said that, for all of his faults, at least Hitler was able to, quote, get things done. That's true, Bernie. It's just a shame that those things were fascism and the Holocaust. After issuing an apology, Eccleston responded to being told by the Associated Press that the World Jewish Congress had called for his resignation by saying that, quote, it's a pity they didn't sort the banks out. They have a lot of influence everywhere. <clears throat> Still, genocide excusing anti-Semitism aside, Queen's Park Rangers had themselves a couple of very wealthy owners. And just a few months later, they had a new shareholder who was much wealthier than both Briatori and Eccleston combined. In December 2007, Lakshmi Mittal acquired a 20% stake in Rangers for a fee of £1.6 million. At the time, Mittal was worth an estimated £25 billion. That made him not just the richest owner in the championship, but in all of world football. Since moving to London, Mittal had become Britain's richest person, ahead of Chelsea owner Roman Abramovich, and in December 2007, the steel magnate was the fifth richest person in the world. Upon their arrival, QPR's monstrously wealthy new owners announced that they had a four-year plan to win promotion to the Premier League. The championship ought to have been quaking in their boots. With their kind of wealth in the pre-FFP era, with any semblance of structure and sound management, QPR would take the division by storm. Thankfully for the rest of the championship, QPR's new regime would have no structure 
or sound management. I say new regime, but Gianni Palladini, who had been QPR's chairman since 2003, was retained following Briatore and Eccleston's arrival, and Mittal's investment. Briatore and Mittal's son-in-law, Amit Batia, became heavily involved in the club's day-to-day -day operations though, with Batia becoming vice-chairman, and Briatore, something akin to a dictator, and not a very benevolent one at that. To say that QPR were chaotically run for the next few years would be an understatement so criminal that it would cause Briatore to flee to the Virgin Islands as a fugitive. QPR's characterisation under their new owners as a boutique club in West London alienated a lot of long-time working-class Rangers fans, though not as much as the massive hike in ticket prices and season tickets that came with it. Briatore and Eccleston came from the very narrow and glamorous world of Formula One, and they entered football with a Formula One mindset. Football isn't Formula One though, and Briatore's ideas of how to run a football club were to meet a pretty harsh collision when they came into contact with reality. The way in which managers and players were talked about and treated was... Suboptimal might be the nicest way of putting it, and problematic, perhaps a more accurate description. You don't have to rely on hearsay and rumour to form that opinion either, since the entire period was subject to a remarkably candid documentary which was later broadcast on the BBC, entitled The Four Year Plan, which featured moments like this. You go there. You know, the other people give more balls to Tomasi, we see, and fit is the guy. Between September 2006 and March 2010, a period of just three and a half years, QPR burnt through ten different full-time managers. That's roughly one every four months. Luigi Di Canio, Ian Dowie, Paolo Souza and Jim Magilton all came and went, unsurprisingly not sticking around for long given the extraordinary overreach of QPR's owners, and particularly Briatori who felt it appropriate, and as though he were qualified, to dictate decisions in regard to team selection and tactics, and branded all football coaches as idiots. In the summer of 2010, Briatori finally stepped back from football operations, though not before routinely arguing with QPR fans outside of Loftus Road. He was replaced by Vice Chairman Amit Batia, Lakshmi Mittal's son-in-law, who became chairman in the process. Batia is almost the textbook definition of a Nepo baby. He was educated at a private school in Delhi before receiving an Ivy League university education in the United States and then walking straight into a job in the city of London. At the age of 24, he married Venetia Mittal, Lakshmi Mittal's daughter, at a £30 million ceremony in Paris. In the same year, Lakshmi Metal also bought Bernie Eccleston's Kensington Palace Gardens mansion, now nicknamed the Taj Metal, for £67 million, making it the world's most expensive house at the time. Four years later, he bought his daughter and Batia an even more expensive mansion also in Kensington Gardens, which was actually the former Philippines embassy, for £70 million. Batia was still only 27 when he became the vice chairman of Queen's Park Rangers, solely because his father-in-law had bought shares in the club, but though he was wholly unqualified for the job, and undoubtedly incompetent in a whole host of ways, he was still a much better chairman than Briatori. Whatever his faults, Batia at least knew that he shouldn't be picking the team, and that the club's football operations were the most important factor in determining their success. Most importantly of all though, he identified Neil Warnock as the strongman, as he put it, who could put Rangers back on the right track. It proved to be a masterstroke. Warnock kept QPR up at the end of the 2009-10 season, and then came another busy summer window. In came Paddy Kenny, because of course he did, it's Neil Warnock, along with Clint Hill and Sean Derry, who he brought with him from Crystal Palace, Cal Walker on loan from Tottenham Hotspur, and another youngster from Spurs, Adel Tarat, who had spent the previous season on loan at Loftus Road. It was chaotic, but for the first time, it was organised chaos, which at least had some justification. QPR had a sensational start to the 2010-11 season, and they ended up leading the championship table, 
for pretty much the entire season. The biggest threat to QPR's season, in actual fact, ended up being the signing of Alejandro Fallin, whose arrival prompted an FA investigation and brought with it the threat of a points deduction. In the end, Rangers only received a fine, and so they were promoted to the Premier League as champions. Almost immediately after winning promotion, QPR fans' excitement at returning to the Premier League after 15 years away was tempered by bad news stories. Briatore and Eccleston were understood to be looking to sell their 66% controlling stake in QPR, valuing the club at an enormous £100 million, and prompting the not unreasonable suggestion that they had only ever been interested in winning promotion at QPR and then looking to turn a quick profit. Ticket prices, meanwhile, were hiked massively once again, with season tickets increasing by roughly 40% to between £549 to £999, and matchday tickets raised to as much as 72 quid. Arsenal and Tottenham were the only two teams in the division with higher prices, on average that season, than newly promoted Queen's Park Rangers. Despite their vast personal fortunes, by this stage leapfrogged only by state-owned Manchester City in the ownership net worth stakes, Briatori, Eccleston and Mittal had shown a reluctance to throw too much money at the club. They lent the club an initial £13.6 million at 0% interest in order to pay off their existing high interest debt when they arrived, but even after winning the jackpot of Premier League promotion, there was a reluctance to spend which left manager Neil Warnock increasingly frustrated. QPR's first three signings following promotion to the Premier League, namely Jay Bothroyd, Kieran Dyer, and Danny Gabadon, were all free transfers. And the fourth, DJ Campbell, set them back just £1.2 million. A fourth free transfer arrived in the form of backup goalkeeper Brian Murphy, but England's second richest football club was essentially feeding off scraps. On August 18th, 2011, the long-awaited sale of the club was confirmed. Bria Torre and Eccleston sold their 66% stake to Malaysian airline boss Tony Fernandez, reportedly for a great deal less than their £100 million valuation. Mittal retained his minority stake, Fernandez took over as chairman, and Batia, who had briefly resigned as chairman in protest of Bria Torre and Eccleston rejecting his bid to become 50 50 partners at Loftus Road, was relegated to the role of vice chairman once again. Fernandez's takeover came under slightly dubious circumstances. A lifelong West Ham United fan, as he had proudly declared on numerous occasions in the past, Fernandez had spent all summer trying to acquire a 51% stake in the Hammers from David Sullivan and David Gold. After his attempts to buy West Ham fell through, Fernandez got in lots of very public arguments with Sullivan and Gold on Twitter about how much money he had offered for the club, how they were failing West Ham, and how fans would be much better off if they just accepted. Within two months of his failed West Ham bid, Fernandez had bought and appointed himself chairman of Queen's Park Rangers. Not as wealthy as Eccleston, and not even in the same ballpark as Mittal, who retained his minority stake, Fernandez was still a very rich man. Fernandez is the owner and CEO of Malaysia's largest airline, AirAsia, and in 2011, he had an estimated net worth of $470 million. By 2012, that had already ballooned to $615 million, and unlike QPR's former owners, Fernandez was willing to throw a lot of money at Queen's Park Rangers. The only problem was that, having arrived so late in the summer, there were only two weeks left following his arrival until the summer transfer window slammed shut, and Rangers had still only spent £1.2 million. Fernandez soon changed that. But the sudden U-turn on transfer strategy and identification of new targets by the end of the window when most Premier League teams have already got most of their transfer business done resulted in a chaotic scattergun approach to recruitment, and that is putting it very kindly. Sean Wright Phillips, Armin Traore, Anton Ferdinand, Luke Young and Jason Punchen, the latter on loan, arrived for a combined total of £10 million over just those two weeks, 
Meanwhile, Joey Barton was signed on a free transfer from Newcastle United, but immediately became the highest paid player in the history of the club on a reported £80,000 a week. The season got off to the worst possible start, a 4-0 defeat at home to Bolton Wanderers, in which Clint Hill was dismissed in the 94th minute, before the takeover had been completed. QPR's new arrivals did herald a brief uptick in form, but following eight games without a win, Warnock was sacked on January 8th, at which point QPR was 17th in the table, one point above the relegation zone. Given the club's chaotic preparations for life back in the Premier League and the scattergun signings that they had made, you could well argue that sitting 17th midway through the campaign wasn't all that bad. But Warnock was never really Fernandez's man. Warnock is arguably the greatest manager of the Football League era since the Premier League broke away from England's other three professional divisions. His CV would certainly back up that claim with a record eight promotions four of them to the Premier League, which is also a record. Warnock is the first to admit that where he excels in getting the best out of a tight-knit group of players over the hard slog of a 46-game championship campaign, he finds it much more difficult to replicate that kind of atmosphere, environment and spirit when working with a larger and, crucially, much higher paid group of players with far fewer games, all of which are against elite-level opposition in the Premier League. Fernandez replaced Warnock with Mark Hughes, which was viewed as a real coup for QPR at the time. Hughes had done an excellent job at Blackburn and Fulham, guiding them to 6th and 8th place finishes in the Premier League, before being given only 18 months to transform Manchester City from mid-table mediocrity into title contenders. Hughes had left QPR's West London rivals Fulham because he felt the club's ambition didn't match his own. Fernandez clearly managed to convince Hughes that QPR's did, that funds would be made available to him, and the contract that he was offered, rumoured to be worth £3 million a year, also probably didn't hurt. It made Hughes the joint 6th highest paid manager in the Premier League, and the 11th highest paid in world football, ahead of Germany head coach Joachim Löw, Borussia Dortmund's Jurgen Klopp, and Juventus's Antonio Conte. QPR threw the proverbial kitchen sink at the January transfer window, with Fernandez, by this stage, surely realising that Rangers were in a relegation scrap, and keen to ensure that his new asset didn't immediately more than halve in value. Ned Manu arrived for £4.2 million, Gibral Cisse for £4.4 million, and Bobby Zamora, from Hughes' former club and QPR's rivals Fulham, for £5 million. It was heavily rumoured at the time that Cisse had been given a contract worth £45,000 a week and Zamora £60,000, but Fernandez and Hughes felt that their goals would steer Rangers clear of the drop. Samba Diakite, Federico Makeda, and Tai Taiwo, meanwhile, arrived on loan from AS Nonce, Manchester United, and AC Milan. QPR's form under Hughes was, well, sporadic might be the best way of putting it. In game week 30, they dropped into the relegation zone, but surprise victories against Liverpool, Arsenal and Tottenham, scattered amongst defeats against relegation rivals like Blackburn, Wolves and Bolton, were enough to retain QPR's Premier League status. But only just. Following the drama of QPR's final day of the season, Mark Hughes stated, quote, I'm really happy for everyone at the club because, as far as I'm concerned, we will never be in this situation again while I am manager. End quote. Over the summer, QPR's investment was enormous. I mentioned in the introduction that they had the fourth highest net spend in the division, but it was wages where they really went mad. Ryan Nelson, Andy Johnson, Robert Green, Junior Hoylett, Jose Bosingua, and Julio Cesar were all signed on free transfers, but they were all also well-established top-flight players on enormous salaries. Cesar, who was signed from Inter Milan just two years after winning the Champions League, was reported to have signed a deal worth £100,000 a week. Then came Park Ji Sung, another Champions League winner, signed for £4 million on astronomical wages, Esteban Granero for £9 million from Real Madrid, Stefan Ambia for £5 million on deadline day from Marseille, meanwhile Samba Diakite's loan move became a permanent one. 
QPR's wage bill had jumped from £27.6 million in the 2011-12 season to £56 million, so it had more than doubled, but the insanity of their 2012-13 spending spree took it all the way up to £78 million. That was more than Borussia Dortmund, who reached the 2013 Champions League final, and 30% more than Atletico Madrid, Champions League finalists in 2014. Clearly, Fernandez's ambition was not just to reach the Champions League final, but to actually win the thing. Chief Executive Philip Beard told reporters, quote, We haven't made the investment of this summer to simply compete at the same level as last season. The investment has been made so that we feel we're a club which can compete against, and beat, every club we play. End quote. Fernandez was, if anything, even more bullish and ambitious, though some may argue that delusional would constitute a better description. While QPR were fighting to stave off relegation the previous season, he was talking about building a new 45,000-seater stadium in just about the hardest and most expensive place to build in all of England, before you even get into the question of whether QPR have the necessary fan base to fill a stadium the same size as Anfield at the time. On the pitch, talk of European football was rapidly made to seem absurd. QPR lost the opening game of the season 5-0 at home to Swansea City, who had been promoted from the championship alongside them in 2011, but had spent just a fraction as much on players and wages. Hughes and Fernandez had targeted experienced players who were tried and tested at the highest level, and could drag Rangers up the league table. What they got, for the most part, was players who were grossly overpaid, disinterested, over the hill, and concerned with QPR only insofar as the club constituted one last final bumper payday for them. Some, like Julio Cesar, couldn't be faulted on the pitch, even if justifying his £100,000 a week salary was practically an impossible task. But others, like Jose Bosingwa, couldn't have seemed any less interested if they had tried. The images of him laughing and joking after QPR's relegation was confirmed later in the season seemed to be the perfect encapsulation of all that was wrong with free-spending Queen's Park Rangers, and the wrong-headedness of their recruitment as a whole. When QPR won promotion, they had a team that was just that. And it showed. When you start to sign players on astronomical wages, that can often lead to rifts within squads and cliques starting to emerge. But that can be forgiven if those players are seen to earn those wages. Few complained at Barcelona or Real Madrid that Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo were paid more than them because they were so good. If you don't think that a player earning two, three, or even ten times as much as you is even better than you though, or at least they're not showing that they are in training or on a weekend, that's when you have got real problems on your hands. QPR had about 11 or 12 of those players, some of whom were real rotten eggs within the dressing room. Joey Barton spent that season on loan at Marseille due to Hughes' view of his negative impact upon the rest of the squad, but Hughes himself would be out the door by November. He was replaced by Harry Redknapp, and in the January transfer window, QPR made their biggest signings yet. Loic Remy and Christopher Samba were signed for in excess of £20 million, with Remy signing a deal reported to be worth £75,000 a week, 50% more than he had been offered by Newcastle, and Samba an eye-watering £100,000 a week, making him the joint highest earner at the club. Samba played just 10 games for QPR, from January onwards they won just two matches, and Rangers went down at that time as the seventh worst Premier League team of all time in terms of their miserable points tally of just 25, despite having the seventh highest wage bill in the division. At least Derby County and Sunderland didn't outspend multiple Champions League finalists in their infamously dreadful seasons. The insane stats don't stop there though. QPR spent an incredible 128% of their turnover on wages alone that season, and they lost £65 million before tax, taking their net debt up to £177 million. The only Premier League teams with more debt were Manchester United and Chelsea, except, of course, 
QPR were no longer a Premier League team. Now they were a championship team in almost £200 million of debt and with the wage bill of a Champions League finalist, spunked primarily on ageing players who had done nothing for them, had little to no sell-on value and even less interest in trying to get them promoted from the championship. The state-of-the-art new £20 million training ground, promised by Fernandez 11 years ago, literally opened its doors this summer. The 45,000 capacity stadium, meanwhile, continues to exist only in Fernandez's head. This is a man who once tweeted asking QPR fans for suggestions as to who the club should sign, and later commented on the idea and the response is, quote, That was superb. Without blowing my own trumpet, I have to say it was inspired by me. You effectively have 100,000 scouts out there for you, and there is no way QPR could know every single player. Suddenly, we have players that we've never heard of, and Neil is looking at videos and thinking, hmm, not bad. It was seen as another mad Tony Fernandez moment, but there was no harm, no downside. End quote. Yeah, it is a real wonder why QPR's recruitment was so chaotic. Fernandez also commented, upon his arrival in 2011, that the areas in which he felt QPR needed to strengthen were in goal, in defence, in midfield, and in attack. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with uh, football, that is all of the positions. It must have inspired great confidence in his squad of players, who had just won promotion to the Premier League. It is worth just comparing, for a moment and almost as a final thought, QPR and their local rivals Brentford. I know this will be painful for QPR fans, but in 2008, QPR had the richest owners in world football, and Brentford were languishing in League 2. In 2011, when Rangers won promotion to the Premier League, the Bees were still in League 1, with an average attendance of just 5,000. In 2012, though, Matthew Benham took full control of Brentford and began a decade of gradually transforming the club from top to bottom. Brentford are now, along with Benham's adversary, Tony Bloom at Brighton, arguably the best-run club in English football. Last season, they finished ninth in the Premier League, despite having the lowest wage bill in the division. In 2020, they successfully managed to move into a new stadium in West London. I mean... It doesn't hold 45,000, but it does the job. For Queen's Park Rangers fans, it's almost like a here's what you could have won. QPR, meanwhile, attempted to run before they could walk under one of the most reckless and brainless ownership regimes in the history of the Premier League. Portsmouth's series of shysters and buffoons might have been more calamitous, the Venkies more cartoonish, and Peter Ridsdale more despised. But in terms of sheer utter derangement, wasted opportunities, and repeatedly shooting themselves in the foot, QPR's cavalcade of idiots are tough to beat. Queen's Park Rangers are still living with the consequences of their 2011 to 2013 insanity more than a decade on. Despite making an immediate return to the Premier League via the playoffs the following season, QPR came straight back down again. Still believed to be in more than £90 million of debt, Tony Fernandez finally stood down as chairman in August 2018, replaced, once again, by everyone's favourite Nepo baby, Amit Batia, who is still the club's chairman now, and is still aged only 43. Last season, having been top of the league a third of the way into the campaign, QPR suffered a collapse which was so abysmal that Tony Fernandez tried to sign it. Following Gareth Ainsworth's arrival in February, QPR won just three games, only finishing six points above the drop. Battered 5-0 by Oxford United in their final pre-season, QPR are a lot of people's favourites to get relegated from the Championship this season. Tony Fernandez, meanwhile, whose net worth has fluctuated wildly in recent years and has more than halved since 2018, down to an estimated $335 million, announced that he had relinquished his shareholding in the club via an official statement just last month. Four weeks on, still, no one is any the wiser as to who owns his former shares. Could it be the Mittals? Some fans have speculated. Their shareholding, through a company called Sea Dream Limited, was at just 10% as per the last set of accounts, but despite being the richest owner in the championship, 
Metal has invested less money in Queen's Park Rangers than he did on his daughter and Batia's wedding 20 years ago. Bernie Eccleston, who made headlines last year for stating that he would take a bullet for first-class man Vladimir Putin, recently had his fourth child, age 92. Him, not the child that is. Flavio Briatore unsuccessfully attempted to launch a new political party in Italy in 2019, which he claimed was neither left nor right wing, but that they would be prepared to ally with fascists, and Tony Fernandez is now the owner and chairman of Pataling Jaya Rangers FC in the Salanga Super League, or PJR for short. QPR begin their 2023-24 campaign away at Watford this weekend. That is it for today's video. Now you know how not to run a Premier League football club. I'm sure that'll come in handy. Let me know your thoughts down below the comments. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Apparently it helps with the algorithm or something or other. And of course, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, both for this channel and my backup channel or second channel, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.